year is 711, and the Byzantine Empire is reeling from the many losses it had suffered only less than a hundred years ago. The Muslims, who came from the deserts of Arabia, had defeated both the Romans and the Persians, and were now the superpower of Asia. To many in the Byzantine Empire, it had seemed like God had abandoned them, as nearly all of the empire's territory outside of Europe and Anatolia had been taken. The Muslims had just concluded their civil war, known as the Second Fitna, which began after the first caliph of the Umayyad Empire, Muawiyah, had died. Eventually, this conflict culminated in the House of the Umayyah retaining their power, leaving al-Walid as the new caliph. During that time, however, the Byzantines gained a period of respite from the Arab threat, and had used that time to consolidate their holdings in Anatolia. The emperor, during the period of the Second Fitna, Constans II, had created a new administrative and military structure organizing the empire, known as the Theme System. As opposed to the diocesan system that Diocletian had previously organized, the Themes organized civilian and military positions to act as one, allowing a quick response to enemy military incursions, without having to wait for an imperial army from Constantinople. However, this also had the unfortunate side effect of allowing governors of certain Themes to gain enough military power to revolt against the Emperor. In spite of this, the time for the Byzantines to catch their breath had ended, with the Muslims beginning their conquest of Hispania, easily absorbing the ancient province. The constant raids into Anatolia also began to intensify, as Al-Walid appointed his brother, Maslama, as the commander of the raids into Byzantium. Following this, Tiana, an ancient fortress city on the frontiers of the two empires, was razed to the ground by the Umayyads after a lengthy siege. The Byzantines during this period were largely unable to respond to the Arab raids, as they were going through an era of instability known today as the Twenty Years' Anarchy. This period of chaos started in 695, when the Emperor Justinian II was usurped by his general, Leontius. He was soon then after usurped by Tiberius, a Germanic officer. However, in 705, both usurpers were executed, when Justinian returned to Constantinople with an army of Bulgar troops to reclaim his imperial title. Justinian's despotic and tyrannical behavior afterwards led to his second and final usurpation by Philippicus, with help from the Khazars. He would reign for two short years, causing religious division by deposing the legitimate patriarch of Constantinople and abolishing the canons of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. This coincided with the Bulgarian Empire, under Turval, plundering the Byzantines right up to the walls of Constantinople. In response to this, Philippicus made in hindsight the foolish decision of transferring the troops of the Opsician theme to the Balkans, further weakening the empire against Arab raids. The troops, who had just been moved to the Balkans, then revolted later that year, proclaiming his secretary, Artemius, as emperor. Artemius and his troops then marched on to Constantinople and blinded Philippicus in the Hippodrome. Artemius, now the emperor, had styled himself as Anastasius II. In order to quell any future rebellions, he had the officers who helped him gain the throne killed and deposed the Monothelite Patriarch of Constantinople in favor of the previous Patriarch, Cyrus, ending the schism in the West. The Arabs by this time had penetrated as far as Galatia, and Anastasius attempted to solve this situation by sending diplomats to the Umayyad court. After this venture had failed, he then undertook a project strengthening the defenses of Constantinople and rebuilt the Byzantine fleet in preparation of further Arab aggression. Meanwhile, in the east, the Caliph al-Walid died from an illness. Although he wanted his son Abdal Aziz to succeed him, this did not happen. Instead, Suleiman, al-Walid's brother, succeeded him as Caliph instead. Immediately, Suleiman fired all of al-Walid's previous appointed governors and appointed new ones to consolidate his power. 
In spite of this, Suleiman continued the militaristic expansion that was characteristic of most Umayyad caliphs and ordered the intensification of a project started by al-Walid to take Constantinople. According to a prophecy, a caliph bearing the name of a prophet was destined to take the city. Suleiman was the only member in the Umayyad dynasty to bear the name of one, King Solomon. Due to this, he swore that he would not stop trying to capture the city until he exhausted the entire country. Umayyad troops then started to gather at a point north of Aleppo, and the existing Muslim fleet was expanded to 1,800 ships. As Suleiman was too sick to command the campaign himself, he ordered Maslama, who had already proven himself against the Byzantines, to command the massive force. Alarmed, Anastasius then sent out a fleet headed by John the Deacon to stop the construction of the new Arab navy, hoping to cut off the supplies of timber needed by the Arabs. This fleet, however, contained the troops of the Opsikian theme who once again had triggered a rebellion, subsequently killing John and sailing back north. Stopping at Adramitium, they acclaimed a new emperor, Theodosius, and continued their trip to Constantinople. Anastasius then headed an army in Bithynia to stop the rebels, but was caught off guard when Theodosius' troops started to attack from the Propontis. This eventually led to the rebels gaining control of Constantinople and Anastasius resigning his position as emperor to live in peace as a monk. The commanders of the Themes in the East, seeing Theodosius rise to power, who was essentially a puppet of the Opsikian troops, refused to swear allegiance to him. It was at this time, in 715, that Maslama had sent a vanguard, commanded by a man also named Suleiman, while another commander under him, named Umar, sailed with his navy to assist the ground troops. Suleiman's vanguard then continued their advance into Asia Minor after wintering at the Cilician Gates. Maslama had then contacted Leo, the governor of the Anatolic theme, to revolt against Theodosius. The Arabs hoped that this would make the invasion easier, as it would cause even more disunity among the Byzantines. Leo had his own plan, however, and secretly conspired to betray the Muslims after gaining their support. Suleiman's army then reached Amorium and sent an ultimatum to its inhabitants to recognize Leo's claim for emperorship. The city of Amorium accepted this offer and subsequently recognized Leo, but refused to let the Arabs into the city. Leo then cunningly managed to enter the city with a garrison of 800 troops without the Arabs, who now withdrew from the city's outskirts due to a lack of supplies. Leo then moved west and openly proclaimed himself as emperor, challenging Theodosius' rule. After the Arab vanguard had withdrawn from Memoriam, Maslama and the main Arab army started to move into Anatolia, marching straight back to the city. Maslama was not aware of Leo's trickery, so did not raid or pillage the territories he marched through. However, Maslama, after linking up with Suleiman's vanguard, learned what Leo had done and changed his army's direction, moving to sack the cities of the Aegean coast. Meanwhile, Leo by this time had marched north to Bithynia and had captured Theodosius' son, who he used as a bargaining chip to peacefully acquire the imperial title. Leo, recognizing Theodosius' humbleness, allowed him and his sons to retire peacefully as monks. Leo, now donning the imperial purple, proceeded to make quick preparations for the imminent siege. Leo promptly negotiated with Tervil asking for an alliance against the Arabs. The Bulgarian ruler, most likely seeing the Arabs as a bigger threat than the Byzantines, accepted this offer, promising to personally lead an army to assist the Byzantines. Leo also proceeded to send guarantees to the Arabs in the vain hope that they had not realized his previous deception. Maslama, who currently was wintering in Asia, proceeded to shrug off his guarantees and marched his force to Abydos, crossing the Hellespont with assistance from Suleiman, who now commanded the Muslim fleet. Maslama's army now plundered his way towards Constantinople, and by August of 717, he had reached the imperial capital. 
Although the exact number of men present on both sides is unknown, it is safe to assume that Maslama's army numbered over 100,000 men, while estimates for the Byzantine garrison numbered around 15,000. The Arab fleet, who now reached the outskirts of the city's coast, numbered around 1,800 ships, far outnumbering whatever the Byzantines could muster. Leo then desperately attempted to offer tribute to the Arabs, promising to give one gold coin for every inhabitant sheltering in the city. Maslama, though, had already made up his mind and built double walls around his army to protect his flanks from the Bulgarians and his front from the Byzantine sorties. Suleiman then had his fleet cross the Bosphorus Strait, cutting the communication of Constantinople from the rest of the world. However, Southerly winds caused some of his ships to stray too close to the city, causing the Byzantines to send a few galleys to attack the isolated vessels. The Byzantine fleet, although small in number, were equipped with a secret weapon known as Greek fire. The fire was created from an unknown substance which allowed the flames to burn anything, including water. The Arab ships were unsurprisingly completely incinerated by this weapon, causing most to burn and sink on the spot, while others still burning made it to the rest of the Arab fleet who witnessed the aftermath of this massacre. The Arab navy was now too afraid to risk another head-on confrontation with the Byzantine fleet, allowing the Byzantines to lift the blockade and ferry supplies into the city. Meanwhile on land, the Arab army was unable to forage for supplies as they had razed most villages on the way to Constantinople. A standstill continued into the winter of 717, where the Arabs started to succumb to attrition as their supplies started to dwindle, along with being unused to the harsh cold. This culminated into a great starvation of the Arab troops, forcing the Arabs to resort to cannibalism and even eating their own feces. Meanwhile, Back in Syria, the Caliph Suleiman passed away with his successor, Umar II, sending two new fleets. The fleets, numbering 730 ships, were primarily composed of Egyptian and African Christians. Despite the increasing setbacks the Arabs were suffering, the situation looked as if it was going to improve for the Arabs. On land, another army of Arab troops, commanded by Mardasan, traveled to the Asian side of the Bosphorus. Once the Egyptian reinforcement fleet had reached Constantinople, they defected to their Byzantine Christian kin, notifying them of the status of the Arab navy who were sitting at port. Leo used this opportunity to strike at the remaining Arab reinforcements, causing mass destruction, capturing vast amounts of equipment and supplies. This enormous victory allowed the Byzantines to gain control of the sea making the Arab navy into a non-factor in the siege. Meanwhile, back on land, the reinforcements that had reached the Asian side of the Bosphorus were soundly defeated by the Byzantines, who exploited their newfound naval superiority to land troops there. Following this, the starving main Arab army was then attacked by Turval's Bulgarians. This engagement caused the Muslims to lose 22,000 men a massive portion of their already shrinking army. Seeing the writing on the wall, in August of 718, a whole year after the siege had begun, Caliph Umar ordered Maslama to withdraw his troops. The retreating Arab army were able to withdraw undisturbed back to Syria, but the same could not be said for the Muslim navy, which sank in a storm in the Sea of Marmara. The aftermath of the siege and its implications could not be understated. The Umayyads had gathered their largest army and navy ever for the attack on Constantinople, to only have an end in failure. It is estimated by most historians that the Arabs lost around 120,000 men, a number of men which dwarfed most European army sizes for centuries to come. This significantly drained the resources of the Caliphate, even prompting Umar to consider withdrawing from the Caliphate's more recent conquests. The Arabs would never again attempt to conquer Constantinople, 
only raiding the Byzantines for religious and economic reasons. As for the Byzantines, this victory was of profound importance, as the very survival of the state depended on it, and their collapse very well could have led to an early Muslim conquest of the Balkans and Anatolia. The Byzantines were now even able to launch offensives against the Caliphate, with Leo sending a fleet to raid Latakia, the home of the Arab fleet. However, the Byzantines were not able to fully exploit their success against the Arabs, as the ever-present Arab raids returned in 720. Leo also reorganized the almost anarchic administration, securing the Byzantine frontiers by repopulating them with Slavic settlers. However, Leo's most noteworthy reform was his religious one, as he was the first iconoclast emperor. Despite previously using icons to boost the morale of the defenders in the siege, in 726 he started issuing edicts restricting the veneration of icons. This would ultimately lead to centuries of religious turmoil in the Byzantine Empire, arguably weakening the empire in the long term. The cause of Leo's iconoclasm is hotly debated, but Byzantine historians such as Saint Theophanes note that he borrowed this practice from Islam which forbade images of holy figures. Nonetheless, Byzantine territories in the west which already were gradually slipping away began to secede in 727, especially after the Pope denounced Leo's iconoclasm. Leo would then rule the empire for another 14 years leaving the empire with another victory in 740 against the Arabs in the Battle of Acroinian. He would then leave his fiercely iconoclast successor, Constantine Capronimus, meaning the dung named, to govern the empire after his death in 741. We thank our patron, 2100 AB, for the continued support. If you would also like to be featured at the end of our videos, please donate to our Patreon located in the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you would like to see more Byzantine history, drop a like and share this video with your friends to boost the algorithm. We thank you for watching.